Okay, I think most people are in who are coming in. This is the first talk of the season, which everyone knows we have our rains retreat for the monks and the nuns, and that's uh, it's not actually finishing until Monday, Monday evening, but uh, coming in here just on a Friday, because only a couple of days have been here for a while. So this evening I wanted to uh, bring, as usual, the talks on Buddhism. This is a Buddhist centre, so we talk on Buddhism here to try and bring those talks uh, to the problems of everyday life and uh, especially that, uh, as everybody here would know, that we had these uh, bombings in Bali recently. There's always terrorist attacks all over the world. There's always strife and problems and difficulties in the world. So I wanted to try and weave the Buddhist talk around these events which affect people's lives. Uh, one of the problems with religion these days, if religion isn't relevant to one's daily life or to one's inner life, if it doesn't actually make uh, sense and it's not important, then people just uh, walk away you know, from religious uh, places because the whole purpose of religion was actually to be relevant to you know, one's daily life and also to give an indication, to give a map of life as a whole, how everything fits in. And in particular, that a lot of people have uh, been talking about, I've heard this in the monastery when people have come to bring dana. This is our monk's meal of the day. We don't have televisions in our monastery. We don't have newspapers at this time of the year. So I found out, find out about these things when people come and tell me. And there is, it reminded me of uh, something in Buddhism, uh, of the story of the Buddha. And uh, many people remember that story, uh, if you've done any study about Buddhism, of this young man who saw an old man, sick man, dead man, and then eventually a monk. And those signs uh, became part of the Buddhist story called the Devadutas. Interesting aside on this story, I like sort of making these asides as we go along. Interesting aside, I've, when I used to go and visit the, the Catholic um, uh, parish house in Bunbury. I used to stay there overnight when I was teaching meditation in Bunbury Jail some years ago. I started they were talking about Catholic saints' days. And those of you who have some knowledge of the Catholic tradition know there's a saint for every day of the year. And in November, there was a saint called Saint Jehoshaphat. And Saint Jehoshaphat became very well known amongst the Buddhists because... The original story of Saint Jehoshaphat was that he was an Indian. And this many, many hundreds of years ago, this Indian fellow, uh, he was actually a prince in India. Saint Jehoshaphat's story is preserved in the Christian annals of Saint Jehoshaphat, uh, kept in Georgia, that's Russia. And Saint Jehosh uh, Jehoshaphat, he was an Indian, and as a young man, he saw, when he went outside of his palace, an old man, a sick man, and a dead man, and then a holy man. As a result, he left his palace, became a holy man, and he, he converted the whole of India to Christianity, according to the story. <laughs> and, and that's actually the story in the texts. And because of that, sort of, he got actually um, uh, included into the Catholic um, list of saints. I think November the 14th or something was his, uh, was his day, somewhere around that time. Of course, only when Buddhism became quite popular in the West and when uh, people, the Catholics, started finding out about the story of the Buddha did they realize, oh, oh, there was another fellow in history who was very famous for being a prince in India who left his home and saw an old man, a sick man, and a dead man, and a holy man. That was the Buddha. And uh, they actually found out Jehoshaphat actually comes from the word Bhagawat. And those of you did some chanting earlier on. We did Namo Tassa Bhagawato. That's actually where Jehoshaphat comes from, when you know, language changes from country to country. This was a story taken along the Silk Route by the traders, and it got to Christianity, and they thought this guy was a Christian. Actually, it was a Buddha. So for about 2,400 years, and, oh, no, not 2,400 years, for about 1,900 years, actually the Catholics were celebrating the Buddha one day a year. Until they found out, and then he's been knocked off the list. But never mind, that's an interesting aside. It's actually, was actually the Buddha. St. Jehoshaphat is no longer a saint on the saints' days anymore. But that by the side, that there was, um, he saw an old man, a sick man, a dead man, and a holy man. And that 
in this the story became a very important part of the the career as it were of the buddha and eventually you know seeking an end to this uh, suffering difficulties of life sat under a bodhi tree became enlightened became the buddha but the important part of that story is from then on they called these things they called them the they called them devadutas which means like the divine messengers or messengers of the gods it's as if like the gods were trying to teach him a lesson about what life really is and from this time on like in monk speak as it were, or nuns speak, well, we, the way we talk in the monastery. Whenever there's a sickness or a death, or you see someone getting old, you know, as the monks start to get old, we always call this actually messengers of the gods. It's a different way of looking at it. Instead of looking at it like a tragedy, something really awful happening, we say that this is learning experience, as if that somebody's trying to tell us something, to teach us something about the nature of life. And as a monk, whenever I see like the uh, pictures, because somebody gave us uh, a copy of the West Australian with some of the pictures of the Bali bombing, as soon as I see those, okay, it's tragic. But I also remind myself, these are what I call like Dewatutas, messengers of the gods. Because sometimes it's very easy to forget what real life is all about. And some of the disasters, or the difficulties, the tragedies of life, it's like... In Buddhism, we call this like, in modern language, a reality check. Bringing us back to what life is all about. Because it's a truth of life that people die. It's a truth of life that people get old. It's a truth of life that people sick. A fellow came to see me today. I hope they're not here because <laughs> he said they came with their son. And uh, he was... Uh, uh, he's getting some good advice about how to be a father, how to be a single father with his uh, f uh, son and daughter. And he was saying, it's very difficult being up sort of teenage kids, because you know, I'm only 35 and uh, I I'm, quite, I'm still quite young. He said, at 35. And I talked to his, I think, 13-year-old uh, son. I said, 35, is that old? And his son said, yeah, that's old. <laughs> at 35, you don't feel old. Those people are 35. I you know, ask your teenage you know, sons and daughters, and they say, you are old, Dad. That's 35. Now, how old are you? If that's old, a lot of people here are ancient. <laughs> We're just that close to being fossils. <laughs> and it's true, isn't it? I used to have this uh, young um, Dharma school for kids, you know, teaching a few of the kids about Buddhism. That's one of the questions I ask them, what is old? And, you know, he's sort of 20 old, he's 30 old, and I said, well, 30 may be old, 40 is definitely old, 45 is ancient. And I said, I'm 45. <laughs> they all laughed. But old age and sickness and death, sometimes we need to do reality checks. We are getting old, aren't we? Come on, be honest. We're getting sick, we're dying. What this is actually is teaching us something. This is real life. A lot of the times, the problems, the suffering which we have, this is what we're talking about here, the suffering, the problem is these things shock us. These things happen unexpectedly. We don't anticipate these things. In Buddhism we say that is the major part of the problem. We think this shouldn't happen. Reality check is reminding us these things do happen. This is part of our life. It's inescapable part of our life. And especially with old age, you know that's you know, unstoppable. No matter of how many um, creams, ointments and stuff you can uh, uh, inject into yourself, no matter how many sort of, uh, um, uh, what's it called, dyes you put in your hair or whatever, you, know, you can't sort of stop yourself aging. And as you get aging, you get uglier. It's true, isn't it? We're all getting uglier. It's true. Come on, be honest with it. Reality check. Uh, and also we get weak and we get more stupid as well. So the thing is, when you expect this, it doesn't really matter anymore. When you expect to be ugly, you're not sort of striving so, so much to be beautiful. And when you sort of expect to be stupid now and again, as you get older and older and older, you can expect it and you can actually be at peace with it. You're not trying to be different than what life is. It's like a messenger of the gods telling you what this life is all about. And if you can accept it, if you let go and be with it, then you can actually get old, ugly, and smelly gracefully. 
<laughs> but that's just old age. You've got sickness as well. You know, because sometimes we get, how many people expect to be healthy? This is a problem. It's okay to be sick. This is one of my little demonstrations which I've done. I've done here before. And I'll do it once again here. Could you please put your hands up if you've ever been sick? Come on. Have a look around. And everyone's, all those who haven't got their hands up didn't hear what I'm saying. Or you're in denial. We've all been sick from time to time. That's the truth. Everyone here has been sick. Is there anyone here who's never been sick? Let's do that one. Okay, so no one here has, has never been sick in life. So sickness is normal. Sickness is usual. So why is it when we go to a doctor, we say there's something wrong with me? I'm sick. <laughs> if you were a Buddhist, if you really understood about you know, life and everything, you would never go to a doctor and say, there's something wrong with me today, doctor, I'm sick. You go to the doctor and say, something right with me, doctor, I'm sick again. So it would be very wrong, it would be very weird. It would be something very wrong with you if you never got sick. So next time you go to see your doctor or specialist and you feel really awful with flu or with cancer or whatever, you go up and say, doctor, is something right with me again? I'm very sick. <laughs> but it's changing the whole perception of, of sickness, isn't it? Instead of sickness being something wrong, sickness becomes part of life, which we don't get embarrassed about. A lot of times people get embarrassed about being sick, and because they get embarrassed about being sick, they never even go to the doctor for the first place. They're afraid to be sick. Sometimes they feel very guilty being sick. You know, if, you, if you get sick, the reason is because you don't eat enough greens. It's your fault, isn't it? Because you don't exercise enough, or because you live in stressful lifestyle, you don't come to the Buddhist society to learn meditation enough. It's all your fault. Now, there was, uh, I was just writing this in a, a little article some time ago. When I was a student, I remember reading a book which was uh, written about a hundred years ago now by Samuel Butler called Error One. It's nowhere spelt backwards. And in this like science fiction fantasy, he imagined a society. Not a real society, imaginary society, where if you commit a crime, like stealing or something, then that's considered a sickness. You know, and then you actually go and see a doctor, and he gives you some pills or something, or a regime, so you stop being sick. Because a lot of sickness, a lot of um, crime, you know, is because of our upbringing, or because we're not you know, in our right minds, that's why we do these things. You know, like speeding or whatever, and so that's a sickness, you go and see a doctor. But... If you are ill, like you've got a cold, or you've got arthritis or something, then that's your fault. You go up in a court of law and you get punished by this. <laughs> so you get six months or something. In, in, one, in this book, there's a wonderful passage where there was a court scene, and this poor fellow was in the dock. He's about to be sentenced by the judge for having a cold. And this was not the first time he had a cold. He was a repeat offender. <laughs> and there he was, sniveling in the dock. And the, the judge really laid it on him. He said, you should take better care of your health. It's your fault. You know, ten years or something he got for being a serial offender. What that was actually doing was making a very powerful comment. Why is it that sometimes we punish crimes? And we heal sicknesses. What's the difference between a crime and a sickness? A lot of crimes are actually sicknesses, and maybe rehabilitation means we're treating these things not for punishment, but trying to heal the reasons why people commit crimes. In the same way, we're trying to heal the body so it doesn't um, display the symptoms of an illness. And also, he was looking at illnesses and how easy it is for people to feel guilty, to feel wrong about being sick. And because they feel guilty and wrong about being sick, number one, they don't go and see the doctor in time. They don't feel comfortable with sickness. And they feel afraid of sickness. And when sickness happens, they get all this emotional stuff around sickness, which makes it worse. When other people get sick, they get upset as well. 
And because of all of the negativity which goes around sickness, not accepting it, we get even more ill. And sicknesses last longer than they should. So the Devadutas, this messenger of the gods, is saying sickness is okay, sickness is normal, sickness is all right. It changes the whole psychology. Instead of being your fault and feel guilty or being afraid about it, we accept it, we work with it, we live with it. It doesn't last very long. We're at peace with it. We take away the stress and the negativity of sickness. It's amazing just how quickly people get better through acceptance. It's uh, one of the stories of uh, sickness. This is one of the powerful stories about this uh, friend, this monk, friend of mine. And he was got very, very sick. So this was when I was in Thailand years and years ago. He got typhoid fever. I think what he told me at the time, the three strains of typhoid, he got two at the same time. So he's a very, very sick man. He almost died. We had to send him down to Bangkok. We had arranged for an ambulance to be at, those who've been to Bangkok, the Hulam Pong station, the main station in Bangkok, managed to arrange an a, a ambulance to be on the platform to pick him up because he was that close to death. And I talked with a doctor who was actually in the ambulance to pick him up and rush him to the hospital. He told me that when he took one look at this monk, he thought no way would he get him to the hospital in time, that he was actually in shock you know, from um, I don't know what lack of fluid or something. He'd had that fever for too long and it was very severe. So this poor fellow was you know, really next to death. They got him to the hospital. They kept him alive, but he never got better. So he sent him to a monastery in England. For many, it was two or three years he was in this monastery really, really sick could not move, or what he did, well, he could move sometimes, he got out of his bed to walk, you know, down to try and get a bit of exercise, and that would take away all his energy for weeks. He'd be lying in bed all this time. And the reason why we sent him to our monastery in England at that time, we didn't have this monastery here in Perth, at that time because we thought he needed Western medicine. With all of the different types of medicine available into the West, and the monastery was quite willing to look after him whatever which way, no matter how much it cost. He had all sorts of different treatments. Nothing worked. He just was on the edge of life and death many, many times for about three years, this poor monk. And what actually um, uh, was the important change, important moment in this sickness was when the abbot of this monastery... Uh, had what we call in, in Buddhism an insight. An insight means like seeing deeply into the problem, right to the root of it. Why was this monk really sick? Why wasn't he getting better? And this monk went up into this monk's room. I, I, I went to see him when he was sick once, when I was visiting there. And it's just, he literally was in the attic of Chithurst Monastery, this old uh, country house, this attic where they sort of kept this very sick monk. <laughs> It was dreary and dim and dull and cold. They kept it as warm as possible, but it didn't really have a good feeling about it. But when he went up there, just this abbot and this one monk lying there, feeling like death, these are the words this abbot said. He said, I've come up here on behalf of all of the monks and nuns in this monastery and all the lay people who look after you and support us. On behalf of everyone, I've come up here to give you permission to die. You can die, it's all right. You don't have to get better. Now those words, this uh, young monk just started crying. He wept, cried his eyes out. From that day onwards, he started to get better. <laughs> and he did get better. No, reasonably better. He's you know, out and about, walks, and reasonably healthy. And uh, you can see the psychology. It was a brilliant piece of insight by that man. That was Ajahn Sumato in England. Brilliant piece of insight. He realized this fellow was sick. He thought that sickness was really being bad. Even worse than um, being sick was dying. That would really upset his friends. After all they'd done to him, all that money they spent, they trying to look after him. And then he goes and dies on you. Now, how ungrateful can you be? <laughs> and in a sense, I think you can understand what a person feels like when they're sick. A lot of times they're trying to get better for the sake of their friends and their loved ones. That's extra stress on sickness. 
So he was saying, it's all right to be sick. Go on, be sick. If you have to die, go on, die. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> what we're actually saying there, you're giving permission for nature to go on and stop controlling it with all these emotional demands we put upon sickness and even death. When it was that degree of letting go, the emotional turmoil or psychology of sickness changes and there's an obvious chance to get better. And so this is like the Devaduta of sickness, the, the divine messenger. Sickness is, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's just got a bad PR job at the moment. It needs better marketing. Even pain, which we're afraid of. Sometimes pain, which comes up in our body. I've mentioned this before. As a Buddhist monk, you were taught how to look at pain. Sometimes that Ajahn Chah would make you sit you know, for long, long, long periods of time. And just, <laughs> he was a very, very great teacher, Ajahn Chah. He was tough as nails. And sometimes you hated him, but now, <laughs> now you realize what a great teacher he was. But sometimes you'd be sitting for hours and hours and hours. He'd start a talk like we're doing now. You know, like an ordinary talk. It's only supposed to last an hour. Then he'd go on for two hours, three hours, four hours. He was getting to close to midnight, five hours, six hours. You had to get up at three o'clock in the monasteries in Thailand. You only have two hours to sleep if you got back. And so sort of two o'clock, he was still talking and you couldn't go. And it came to three o'clock. He said, you know, five to three, you can go now. Go to the toilet and back for three o'clock for the morning session. Oh, he was tough. <laughs> And you had to sit on the, the hard concrete without any cushions on. It really hurt. And There's only one of two choices there which you had. Either you just got into anger and that just felt terrible, or you actually learned how to just to let go. And when monks did this, after a while you just let go and there was no problem anymore. The thinking about it was a problem. With all pain, the thinking about it, that's what hurts. The experience itself is actually quite bearable. But you think about it and it gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. So understanding this, this through the experiences and the trainings, and this is what you can train with. Whenever you get sick or ill or with pain, and pain happens again and again and again in our life, it's messengers from other gods, it's teachers, something we have to learn. The next time you have pain, stop thinking about it. Stop thinking pain is bad. Stop thinking that, you know, that weakness is bad. Try to say it's good. That pain is okay. Allow it in rather than trying to keep it out. And if you can, stop thinking about it. Make your mind very peaceful and just allow it to be. You'll find the whole experience of pain sickness disappears. Or rather, not disappears, but changes. Pain is still there, but... Something has disappeared. What's disappeared is what in Buddhism we call the two darts or the two thorns. This is a simile of the Buddha. He said it's like the human person is being pricked with two thorns or two darts, the physical and the mental. He said of those two, the physical, you can't really do much about. All people get sick, all people experience pain from time to time. You can't do much about that one, but what you can do about is the mental part, the mental thorn. The body's aching, the mind is aching too. That's the ordinary person. The body's in pain, but you take out the mental dart, which is, I don't want this. I can't stand this. This shouldn't be. This is wrong. Take that dart out, and you'll find the whole experience of pain completely changes, and it's quite acceptable. Not only that, but the death as well, when we see the death of others, such as in Bali, or we see it uh, in traffic accidents, or you see it in yeah, the, the hospitals, in your family, sometimes it seems, because of our society, just so sad. Such a tragedy we call death, when the media play it up. But death is happening all the time. These are messengers. The reason why people get really upset is because sometimes death happens where it shouldn't happen. 
Um, if it's happening where we don't expect it to happen, it's, we, sometimes we expect it to happen on the on the roads from time to time. Sometimes we expect it to happen in the hospital. Sometimes we expect old people to die. That's okay, but young people dying, or children dying, or children dying in swimming pools, or children dying, young people dying when they're partying. There's something in our culture say, okay, you can die other places, but not these places. But what the Deva Dutas are saying, these are messengers from God, they say you can die anywhere, at any time. This is our life. But just in the same way that so death is normal, so, so just the same way as like a sickness is normal, so death is normal. And as a monk, I keep asking me, what is wrong with death? Again, it's just got a bad marketing, that's all. Now, when I'm saying this, I'm saying this just not as a joke. What I'm saying is that when we try to accept, when we learn how to accept these things, so we're not shocked with these things, it changes the whole meaning of our life. In the same way, where we understand what pain is, it changes the whole meaning of sort of sickness. When we understand what sort of death is, it changes the whole meaning because we know, okay, death is is it's going to happen one day. So it makes the life more important. We always say, how much time have we got? How much time have you got left before you die? According to statistics, if you look how many people in this room now, maybe 200, 250, in one year's time, I think maybe five of you will be dead. Which ones are they? Have a look around. And don't look at the old ones, <laughs> because it's not always the old ones. <laughs> and when I mentioned that, I mentioned that just you know, because I don't know why people laugh when I keep on mentioning it like this. Why people think it's funny. It's quite sick, isn't it, really, in one sense. <laughs> why people think it's, it's funny is because it's true. Now, when we come to terms with our death, it's a day or two. What it's telling us is not to be sort of morbid. It's telling us that life is valuable, that life is precious. Every time that we see someone dead, instead of getting upset and afraid, and so that's going to, you know, because we're not in denial, we don't think it's going to happen to us, basically. It's reminding us of something we think we don't want to know. We should know this. And as we do know this, we come to realize how precious life is. When I say how precious life is, it means you haven't got time to have arguments with your loved ones. You know, if today was your last day, if the world was going to end tomorrow, what would you do? Have you got anyone you have to say sorry to? Have you got anyone you really want to say how much you appreciate and love them? How important they are to you? If this was your last day, how many husbands and wives would have arguments? If it's on the last day, close to death, the whole, um, the whole rules of the game change. And instead of like being so critical and so mean and so selfish, we only have one more day to go. We look upon life and each other in a completely different way. We'll be far more forgiving, far more loving, far more caring, not so critical, not so harsh on our judgments of ourselves and others. If this was your last day, what death is telling us is saying this could be your last day. You know, this, this could be your last week. This could be your last year. So make sure you live this day. Now, as it's your last, I don't mean like, okay, let's party, it's our, it's our last day. That's not how people live their last days. How people live their last days is, is knowing that things like you know, relationships, friendships, kindness, love, compassion, all those what we call spiritual qualities, they become paramount, they become important. That's why when we have something like sort of a tragedy in Bali, what do people start talking about? Some people start talking about revenge, and they're stupid people. Cause that just makes more terrorist bombings in the future. Well, people try, try to, to think about, well, let's make sure these things never happen again by 
solving the root problem of hatred and bigotry. And how do you, how do you actually solve hatred and bigotry in the world? In the same way you solve hatred and bigotry in your family. You know, by being more forgiving, more understanding, more listening, more caring. We can all do that in our life. Now start with your husband, start with your wife, start with your children, start with your friends, start with your mother-in-law, whoever else it is. Just <laughs> be really that little bit more caring, a little bit more forgiving. You know, the fellow, you know, this fellow who came to the monastery a few days ago was uh, talking about his children. He forgot what it was like to be a child, to be a teenager. It was you know, trying to control them so much. And I gave him this, this wonderful simile of... Uh, an experience which happened in northeast Thailand some years ago. In uh, you know, in uh, Thailand, in the Southeast Asia, in the uh, farming communities, you know, they grow rice and they they don't have enough money for for mechanical plows, so they use water buffalo. And these water buffalo, uh, they pull the plow. You know, what they eat becomes the fertilizer at the other end. The fertilizer factories as well. And uh, they're almost part of the family. They live underneath the, the houses. And during the, the dry season, they have to be taken out into the fields to graze. And this man was taking a water buffalo out to graze. He was walking along the path past our monastery. And for one reason or another, the water buffalo spooked and wanted to run away. And this man tried to hold on to the, the rope with the, carrying the water buffalo. And everybody should know that water buffaloes, these big sort of animals, are far more powerful than the, than the human. And so the water buffalo was running away, the string wrapped around the top of his finger and pulled the top of his finger off. So he came into the monastery just, you know, with half a finger, just was, you know, see a bit of bone and the blood there. And so, you know, he came in there, so he wrapped up the wound and we sent him into hospital. He was okay afterwards, you know, he didn't sort of die from it, but it was a bit grisly. But anyway, we thanked him because you know, he gave us another story. And that other story is like, sometimes your children are like water buffaloes, aren't they? They're stronger than you. So if you, they want to sort of go somewhere and run away, you try and stop them. You know, you're going to sort of get fingers pulled off and other things pulled off. You're going to get a lot of suffering and pain. That water buffalo it only ran away about half a kilometre. It just stopped there. Just let it go. Let it go. Then you can just walk after it afterwards and you get, keep your old five fingers and you keep your sanity if you've got teenage killed, children. So a lot of times you just let them go a little bit. Then you can pull them back afterwards. But they're water buffalo. And that simile also is with husbands. Or, or wives. Sometimes they're like water buffalo, aren't they? I mean, you try and stop them. What happens? You get things pulled off. And it hurts. So <laughs> this is like the symbol of the water buffalo. And he came and actually thanked me because it really worked. And when he, actually, when he let his uh, children have that little bit more freedom, they didn't ask for so much. They were actually much better kids afterwards. They were just you know, rebelling. And when they got something to pull against, they'd always pull. When they got nothing to pull against, they'd just stay at home and be good kids. So this is actually just like the same with like uh, any things in life, whether it's sickness and death. These are things like big water buffaloes. You can't fight some of these things. You let them go and then they're actually no problem anymore. A lot of times it's because we don't really accept what real life is. When we don't accept what real life is, we get really confused. When real life comes along, you know, like in a body bobbing, or we go to the doctor and someone tells us we've got a bad cancer or we're about to die, or we get a phone call from a relation somewhere and say they're very sick or they're dying or they're dead. We get shocked at these things because we don't expect them, and we don't expect them because we're basically living in cloud cuckoo land. You know, we're in denial of the truth of life. And so when we actually come to the truth of life, it's not at all morbid and sad. It actually makes life much more beautiful. In the sense that life becomes much more precious. When life becomes much more precious, we don't argue with each other so much. We're much kinder with each other. Spiritual values become much more important. Monetary values become put in their right places. You know, uh, 
important, but not the be all and end all of life. And we become happier and more peaceful people. When we become happier and more peaceful people, it means we're learning the lessons of these things. We're learning the lessons of how to live together in peace and harmony together. We're also learning about you know, what life is all about. Now we have this space of time between our birth and our death and what we're using this for. And some people actually ask you, well, what is life for? What's the purpose of life? And it shouldn't really sort of uh, be that hard for a person to understand that the reason of life, the reason why we're here, is actually to learn. You know, it's actually to learn about life, you know, to learn about sort of how to be at peace with ourselves, how to be kind to ourselves, how to be at peace with other people, how to be kind with other people, how to be forgiving. And like some people, sort of very hard to learn. That's why the Buddha gave this simile of these, these horses. And in the simile of the horses, he said, some horses learn very quickly. You don't even need to actually uh, even hit them. You just say, you know, go a bit faster or go to the left, and the horse does it. They're very good horses, easy to train. Other horses, you've got to get the stick out. But as soon as the shadow of the stick or the goad falls upon their body, they realize, uh-oh, I better you know, do the right thing now, otherwise it's going to be in big trouble. That's the second type of horse. They're just the shadow of the whip is enough. The third type of horse, you've got to tap them very slightly. Just a very slight tap, just to remind them. And then, oh, okay, yes, and then they learn about life. The fourth type of horse, you've got to whack them once. But only once, and once they know, oh, that really hurt, I'm not going to do that again. And then they do the right thing. The fifth type of horse is the one you've got to keep hitting and hitting and hitting again, again, again. They still they don't learn. Which type of horse are you? <laughs> <laughs> And unfortunately, many people identify with the fifth horse. <laughs> because how many times do you have to learn? And of course, you know, what that hitting of the whip is, is the suffering of life. How many times do we have to be hurt by life until we learn? How many times do we have to get angry at other people? And that's actually hitting yourself again and again and again until we learn. What does anger do? Does anger get you anywhere? If you cultivate anger, then you start a terrorist group in your home. How can I blow up my, my husband or my whatever else it is? It's the terror tactics, isn't it? By words of mass destruction, the way you sort of talk to each other. You can't be, you can't be, people are like that. It talks about mass destruction, you know, the, was that the pen is mightier than the sword, and certainly the words are much mightier than many other things in life create so much suffering in time, in life. Why can't we actually learn about these things and learn actually that anger just hurts everybody? Certainly it hurts you. Anybody, whenever you get angry, next time you get angry and say something really rotten, ask yourself how it feels. What does it feel inside to you? So do you does that actually feel good? Is that happiness? Is that how you want to feel in life? When we get angry at someone else, don't say they deserve it, don't justify it. Because how do you feel? If, if you justify it and you say that person deserves that, why are you allowing them to make you unhappy? Why are you allowing other people to control your happiness when you're suffering, by allowing them to make you upset? When you put it that way, it's actually stupid getting angry at others. You're allowing them to control you. The next time someone actually you know, tries to upset you, tries to push your buttons, be tough, be rebellious. Don't allow them to control you at all. They call you a pig. Just go, oink, 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 oink. <laughs> or whatever it is, you know, just don't allow them to control you. Just <laughs> so, so you don't get upset. It's, people actually try that on you. you know? They try to, you know, to try and find your weak spots. That's, you know, those of you who've been school teachers, you know the first day in class, all the children are trying to find your weak spots. Trying to sort of, you know, that, even as a monk, sometimes you have to go to schools and actually, uh, you know, they try, the kids try and find your weak spots as well. So, you know, so, you know that, uh, when I used to go to uh, teaching schools, sometimes it was girls' schools, about 13 or 14 years old. They're the most dangerous for a monk. Because I remember that one of the toughest questions I got asked when I was in a girls' school. Because you know, after I was giving a, a talk on Buddhism and Buddhist culture, 
And then afterwards, you used to ask any questions. And so this girl put her hand up and said, do girls turn you on? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs> well, I thanked her because that's another sort of story for my talks. <laughs> but one of the, the funniest times, this is going on from the tangent again, I went to give a talk at a, per, a girls' school in Perth. And I think it might have been Mercedes. I'm not quite sure. But it was one of the, the top schools in Perth. A couple of days later, I was doing some business in Perth and walking along, I think, Hay Street, or could have been a Murray Street, Murray Street it was. Walking along Murray Street, and these girls came in the opposite direction. They say, hi, it's sort of uh, uh, nice to see you again. They say, oh, do you remember me? And they said, yeah, you, know, you came to give a, a talk at our school a couple of days ago. And I said, that's really, I really feel very flattered, you remember me. And the girl said, we'll never forget anyone who's called Bra. <laughs> So, bra remember the ebb of the end? <laughs> so they just try to wind me up, as like, you know, teenage girls sometimes do. <laughs> Great name, isn't it? <laughs> Anyhow, the, when you let, one of the things I was, I was taught as a, as a school teacher, and I keep as a mic, if you make a mistake and people actually try to, to make, a, make fun of you, you laugh with them. Then they're never laughing at you. You know, they're laughing with you, and so it's a joke together. So it's the same when sometimes tries to make you angry by sort of making a joke at you. You laugh at yourself as well. And then it's laughed together. So you're never allowing another person to actually to make you angry and upset. You're not allowing other people to control your happiness. And this is actually the, what we learn in life. This is what the whole purpose of life is. Learning these ideas, these techniques, so you are at peace with yourself. That's actually grade one. When you go into or primary school, when you go to secondary school, you do more than just like being at peace with life. You start actually learning more about yourself. You know who you are and how life is and how life works. And that's where we get into things like you know meditation, actually to find out who you are. Who are you? Have you found out yet? How long have you been living with yourself? Some of you have been living here 50, 60, 70 years. Do you really know who you are yet? About time you found out. And how, how can you find out who you are? The only way you can find out who you are is having a look. But so often, how many people are actually looking inside? How many people are actually look outside into life? And it's a very good like, little metaphor. We always look outside at our husband, at our work, at other people, today at the monk, at the, no, tomorrow, at yesterday. How many people actually look inside? And what we really mean by looking inside is actually in the present moment, inside, to see actually who we are. A lot of times when we start to look inside, we get a bit afraid of what we might find. So a lot of times we're, we're afraid, we, we haven't got the courage to actually to look. That's the reason why people can't become still in meditation. We're afraid to you know, find out what's actually in there in the present moment. We're always running away. We run away from real life, like death, like sickness, like ourselves. And we never find out about life this way. The Devadutas, the divine messengers, actually saying, look, this is death's going to happen one day. You better actually you know, have a look now to find out what this is all about. Because one day we'll be in a, a bar in Bali. Not me, because I'm a monk, but you know, we'll be <laughs> somewhere in a hospital where we're about to die, we're getting sick. That happens to us one day. We better find out pretty soon who we are and what life is all about. One of the nice things about Buddhism, and obviously I'm praising Buddhism because I'm a Buddhist monk, one of the nice things about this is no one is going to tell you what to believe. No one's going to tell you the solution, but we're going to really help you find out for yourself. We're going to actually to tell you the way to find out, to look inside, and how to look inside, what to look out for, but it's up to you actually to know what's inside and what this life is all about, and what happiness, what suffering is, and what pain and what freedom from pain is. And this is the whole point of this path of meditation, to try and encourage people to you know, stop running about, you know, thinking life is going to be all happiness and fun. Find out about yourself, first of all. Find out who you are and what life is. 
you start getting into deep meditation, which everyone does eventually if you give it enough time, not only is it very happy and a very peaceful, wonderful way to spend an hour or a couple of hours, you also start to find out some amazing truths about yourself. You find out, for example, that the reason why we get upset, why we're unhappy, is called desire. Because we want something other than we've got. And as soon as we develop a tiny bit of contentment, of letting go, so we don't want anything for a few moments. Have you ever actually been content in your life? When have been the happiest moments of your life? Have a look back, the happiest moments in your life. A lot of times the happiest moments in your life are happy because they're moments of deep contentment. Moments when you don't want anything else in the whole world. You're so happy to be here, so content. Everything is right and nothing is missing, nothing you want, and nowhere you need to go. That's why that word contentment is such a powerful word in Buddhism. Contentment is another way to saying, for those few moments you've got no desires, nothing you want, nothing missing, nothing lost. Those moments of contentment in your life, you'll find are the, the most tranquil, serene, peaceful, happiest of your life. They are clues. They are also divine messengers of what real happiness truly is. If you try and control the life, when you want to live forever, you don't want sort of um, tragedies to happen in your life, then actually you're asking for something life can't give you. When you don't ask... Life gives you everything. When you're content, just to be here, you find you have everything you ever wanted. It's like finding the hidden treasure, but the, the place where it's all buried is right inside of you. You have enough already. In this very deep spiritual sense. This is what meditation starts to teach you. That so the happiness of life comes from contentment. When one starts to do this, one starts to get deeper and deeper into you know, the mind, in, deeper and deeper into you, and then you start finding amazing things. One of the amazing things you find through this power of meditation is the nature of your mind, you know, who you are. You find that this body is very external, and the mind is something different. As I already mentioned, with pain, we get bodily pain, we get mental pain. Just because the body hurts doesn't mean the mind has to hurt. When we understand what the mind truly is. Not only do we know that the body might hurt, but the mind doesn't need to hurt. You'll know that the body dies. That which we call mind, stream of consciousness, will want and will not die when you die. Bodies come and go. This is not the first body you've had. It, for many of you, it won't be your last. You've been born and died many times. If you think you finish with school, think again. You may have to go back there all over again. Can you imagine going back to school? Well, even more than that, imagine having nappies again. And, you know, sucking on the bottle, having to go to primary school all that sort of stuff, all over again, having to study for your TA, TE exams, if you're lucky, that is. But sometimes we have to go through this all over again. You've done it many times, getting old and getting sick and dying. This is what we call like the Buddhist idea of rebirth, reincarnation. These aren't like truths which you just have to read in the books and actually accept just because someone said it. Again, there are ways where you could find out that you have lived before, that the mind doesn't get extinguished when you die. And because so many people in the West are skeptical about you know, rebirth, sometimes this is one thing which I got really quite surprised at when I started coming over to the West and, and uh, you know, teaching about things like rebirth. I couldn't understand why. It was actually irrational why so many people believe there wasn't such a thing as many lives. The evidence is out there. There's books about people who recall their past lives. It seems, you know, amazing that people think there's only one life. How can you explain like things like child prodigies? Even a Mozart, was it seven years of age, he was writing symphonies, 
He couldn't have done that just in seven years of, of life. When actually one starts to look at the evidence and actually to challenge, be skeptical, not about the evidence, be skeptical about you know, some of the very hard-held views which we have, and who knows where they came from, but sometimes they don't fit reality. And it seems to be the most obvious thing that we've lived many, many times. There's many evidence of people who record their past lives, getting evidence you can't find any other way. If you want to find it out for yourself, you can meditate until you get into such states of meditation, you can actually recall past lives. Several people do those. You could do those if you put enough effort into meditation and do it properly. At the very least, you'd know the nature of the mind is something which is independent of the body. When the body dies, the mind won't die. When one starts to experience those things as truths for oneself, it, it makes a whole idea of like old age sickness and death a change. But people get really upset at young people dying because we think, you know, there's one chance at life and it's all been taken away, it's gone. We think, why? Why did you know, all those young people, most of young people in Bali, why did all the young people die there? It seems unfair. When we start to put things in you know, the wider perspective of Buddhism and Hinduism, not only Christianity to believe in rebirth as well, so did Socrates and Plato in Greece. All those ancient philosophers all had very, very strong beliefs in rebirth and experiences as well, when they remember these things. If we put everything in that sort of context, then the sting of death gets far less. And the fact that people die young, in one life, die old in the next life, and then middle in the life afterwards, sort of averages out. And sometimes you can see with many lives the law of karma, why people die young, why people die old, why people die middle. Very beautiful teaching. The Buddha said that if you are really well, caring for other people, giving other people long life, then of natural justice you'll get long life yourself. If you like a soldier in an army or a butcher in a in a shop and you take away the lives of others, then you'll have a short life next time. To learn the value of life, not as a punishment, but as a learning experience. So you learn just how valuable life is. So there's many people in this world who do terrible acts, killing other people. When they come back, they'll have to have short lives. Sometimes people ask you about the law of karma. Why is it that you know, people die together? Very often because we do karma together. The gangs, the armies, work together to, to kill or to, to hurt. We do karma together, the results come together very often. So, you know, this is some of the understandings of the question why. It's plausible. You can actually look into your mind and see that these things actually work, they're true. And they give the answer to the question why these things happen. And also they take away the worst part of it because, okay, you know, they had a short life this time, next time they might have a longer life, as long as they're still making the right karma. So that way that revenge doesn't make any sense anymore. If I you know, kill you because you killed my brother, I'm just adding to the worst karma of this world. And every religion you know, teaches that anger doesn't end with more anger. You know, ill will doesn't end with more ill will. Violence doesn't end with violence. The only way to stop anger, ill will and violence is to give forgiveness and love. Hard to do. When you realize the results of not giving these things, it's the only option to do. Sometimes the hardest way is the best way. And so when we understand about life, rebirth, the mind, we can actually put these things in perspective. And that Buddhist perspective gives a far greater sense of peace, understanding about life. We're learning much more about life, about this, what life really is, birth to death, another birth to death, and why we get long lives, short lives, why sometimes we die violent deaths, sometimes you know, non-violent deaths. It's all because the cumulative actions we've done in the past. The very best, the very least, sorry, you can say it's plausible, 
If you want to check that out, get it deep into your meditation, you'll see the truth of that for yourselves. You don't have to believe it from anybody. And it gives a far greater sense of peace, harmony, even social cohesion, because it takes away the need for revenge, it takes away the demand for retribution. In the same way, if we do something which is bad, we feel guilty about, we don't need to seek retribution from ourselves. We seek to learn, to make amends, not through punishment, but to make amends through understanding. I think that that's probably the best message for whether it's a Bali bombing or whether it's a tragedy in your family or whatever other tragedies in life. These are messengers, these are teachers, come to remind us about what life is, what the purpose of life is, what we should be doing so we can understand why we can know what to do when there's tragedies and we can be at peace and at ease understanding life. So that's a little talk today about sort of life, the messengers, suffering, what we should do about it, why and all of that. Thank you very much for listening today.